thank you both. Uh, what a treat. <laughs> thank you. It's great to be here. It's so great to be here. Um, so I think one reason I, I really love these films together is because they they kind of defy our expectations of what you might expect. Like in the case of Song's Madrella of a concert film and of the Velvet Underground of like a, a rock, you know, music documentary. And I was wondering maybe to start, you could both talk about how these projects came about, but also talk about how you were thinking about working within and also against these genres. So Ted, uh, I'm sorry, Ed, maybe you want to Ed, start, you want to start by talking about uh, how, how you came, how it was that you shot this, this performance? Well, you know, starting out, I shot a lot of concerts, you know, with stones, with, you know, uh, and when I was offered to direct and shoot this, I had a meeting with Lou and John Cale, and the first thing Lou said to me is, I don't want the camera between me and the audience. So I thought about it and I said, well, could I shoot the rehearsals? And that opened up and he said, yes. And that opened up a whole idea for me as a concept that because it was only th those two on this stage that was a void that I could make it very personal between them. And that I could do something that I've always wanted to do is have a moving dolly shot where I could move to the rhythm and the, the feeling of the music. So I was giving hand signals to the dolly grip. So I was moving with the song. So and then I realized it's really about the reaction between them. So I just canceled the idea of an audience and just let it be them. And then I did shoot one night performance where I had multiple cameras, but those cameras were way off the stage. And so that gave me a different idea, or I think feeling, to how to photograph them. And I knew it was about their faces. It, it creates such an incredible sense of intimacy in the in the performance without the audience applause between the songs and, and all of that, which I, which just sucks you into the performance. Um, to answer your question about the convention of the documentary, which is a new um, endeavor for me to make a documentary. Um, I think initially the, the immediate, uh, you know, um, sort of challenge and thing that we didn't have with the Velvet Underground as a subject is the kind of material that you would have with most rock docs. You don't have concert footage, you don't have promotional material, you don't have all of that stuff. But that what you do have instead is the cinema of Andy Warhol, which is the only place this band appears during the years that they significantly, for the most part, in the, in the years in which they were putting out records. And you have this extraordinary uh, cachet of avant-garde cinema that is not just ornamental or illustrative of what was going on in the, in the 60s or in New York. It is this band was intrinsically involved with so many of these filmmakers and their work. And so it was an incredible opportunity mm -hmm. to make that be the sort of visual bloodstream of of how we tell the story. I think the one thing that I felt in distinction from traditional rock documentaries is that I didn't want the oral history, the words right. to lead the experience. I wanted the images and the music mm -hmm. to be the way you remember experiencing the film. And of right. course the words are there and the stories are there and the document, the interviews that we got yeah. were extraordinary, but they're there as sort of a, invisible hand mm -hmm. to the structure of the storytelling. Sure. Um, I want to come back to that and really how you, you piece together all this incredible material. But before that, I mean, maybe both of you can say a little bit about your, what, you know, what the Velo Underground means to you. And obviously, 
Ed, it sounds like you know you you go you go back a little bit. I mean, you sort of <laughs> with uh, with Lou Reed, uh, and maybe you. Yeah, I, I, I just love to hear like whether you had any, either of you had any. You know, well, obviously Ed did, but Todd, did you have any? Did you meet Lou Reed? Like, well, you know, ever? I, I did not. You never did. I I would see him at you know, um, you know. Uh, Openings. Yeah, he used to come to screenings here. Biennial, yeah. mm-hmm. Whitney Biennial openings right. with Laurie Anderson. And I, we would all be like, oh my God, there's Lou Reed and Laurie Anderson. <laughs> you know, but I, I never could brave the, the uh, walk up to Lou Reed. Unlike Mr. Ed Lockman, who worked right. with Lou intimately. Yeah, it's always strange working with Todd on these films that somehow I was around at the time. So it's always <laughs> an immersive experience. To then revisit it with Todd. I, I Some, actually lived, not Mildred Pierce, not well, the nineteen thirties. That's true. Not the not Wonderstruck. <laughs> that's true. You know, that's come true. on, dude. That's true. But I actually <laughs> lived in an apartment at Paul Marcy's apartment with Nico for two weeks, and I didn't know it was Nico. It was almost towards the end of her life. She was in this Mau Mau. She would come out late at night, and we have talks. And then I asked Pierre Cottrell, his French producer, got me there. Who was that <laughs> woman? That, that was Nico. So I was just kind of oblivious to what I was around growing up. What, what were you up to in the 60s? The period that we see Mostly in the film. drugs. <laughs> <laughs> you were right there then. Yeah. In your own way. No, I, Ohio. I was in the Dillon and, you know, I, was, I actually was at the uh, factory once or twice. I knew Viva very well. And, oh, wow. That's awesome. No screen test of Ed Lockman? No, no screen test. No. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> but, Todd, the significance of the Velvet Underground to you, I, I think we, we do associate you with... Um, you know, music has been an important part. Musicians have been an important part in your films. Um, obviously, with 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 Dylan, with Bowie, with Karen Carpenter, and so, where does the Velvet Underground fit in to that cosmology? You know, they were the biggest influence to Karen Carpenter. So I <laughs> I learned about them through Karen's work. Um, um, <laughs> you know, it's so funny. You the way you find things when you're young is in this strange sort of counterintuitive but sort of predestined journey and that was true for me with the the velvets where i'd already been listening to punk rock and to roxy and to bowie before i landed in college and then it was like okay this is the root of all of this this is the the root chord you know to this to this to all of these various genres of music. And when I heard The Velvets, and it was, I think it was the, you know, the first record that I remember so vividly kind of entering, um, it, it did something to me that has been well described in other ways. You know, when Brian Eno said that only, you know, 5,000 people bought the records, but they all started a band. Um, it's, there was something intrinsically creatively inspiring about that music in ways that was slightly different from other music that one loves and is drawn to. And, and it, I feel like it, I feel like this band feel sort of singles you out as a subject and sort of says, we recognize you. It's sort of what Jonathan Richmond describes in the film. And, and, in, and I, but I also think that there's something about, for me at least, it, there was some connection made between the idea that creativity itself has a transgressive component and that this music was the product of that understanding. And cre- creativity is not necessarily some healthy, holistic endeavor that you need to kind of you know, go into some of the depths of your own feelings and desires and conflicts. And this band was speaking to those kinds of things. And, and that's why it summons a creative uh, kind of, you know, necess- necessary reaction. Can you say a bit more about the, the process and 
this is your first documentary, but in some ways I, I can see this being kind of in line with a lot of like your other films and that I think of you as like a very kind of like research driven, obsessive in the best way, you know, kind of filmmaker, like in terms of like how you, how your films come about, that there is so rooted in, in detail. And also I think of you as a historian in some ways, given, given the, the different periods and different cultural climates and, you know, different environments that you've tried to conjure in your fiction films. So what was the process like for this? I can imagine it looks like a lot of work, <laughs> I mean, like just in terms of like just the sheer amount, the sheer variety of footage that you've incorporated here, yeah. you know, the, the number of people you've tracked down and talked to, like just, yeah, the process, how, how is that that fit in with, with your the research and your other films? When I introduced the film before, I had neglected to sort of acknowledge some of the key partners who made the film possible. And um, that started with the production team of Motto Pictures, who who partnered with me and Christine Vachon, and without whom the structuring and the financing, but also the research and the entire sort of zeitgeist of, of getting into this period, or the sort of gestalt, I guess, of how you navigate the process. I relied on these folks, Julie Goldman, Chris Clemens, and Carolyn Hepburn. Um, but Brian O'Keefe, my partner, who's a researcher, was took that first deep dive into the archives for into the sort of curating mm -hmm. of the master list of what would be our database for the for the for the uh, experimental cinema that we wanted to employ in the movie and then it was about collecting it all in the avid editing um you know systems that we were working with with my two prime collaborative partners as is true with documentaries, my editors, Fonzo Gonsalves and Adam Kernitz. And, the, and, and then the, the research process of interviewing all of the surviving people who were there. And that was my criteria for who to interview for this film. And we, we completed the interviews and Ed shot the interviews in 2018. And we had basically put together the archive, the uh, database of all the material and put it into the, to the AVID. So we had everything we needed when, after I finished my last feature film, Dark Waters, we, I was in LA with Fonzie and Adam was in New York uh, and COVID hit. And we were sort of almost given full allowance to dive so deep into this world. And we really, it was such an incredibly creative, nourish, creatively nourishing experience. Adam and Fonzie and I would, would say, we, we, let's just not ever stop. Let's not finish it. <laughs> let's just keep cutting this movie forever because it was so, and partly it was because of the times we were in and how much we needed yeah. creative sustenance to get us through it. So we had this world to dive into and we had everything we needed to do so. Was that always clear to you from the start to not make a film that was necessarily just about a band but about a world, an environment, because that, that comes through very clearly from, from the beginning of the film in terms of like how, you know, the story is told. You, 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 you take great pains to actually like situate us in a world that's very clearly drawn, um, which I think is not a typical move, I think, for a music documentary necessarily. It, it was clear because of the culture that was happening the creative culture that was happening here and the cross-pollinating strains of visual art, filmmaking, poetry, dance, that this, the whole idea of the happening, what a performance experience might be like, what are the parameters that define these various genres of art, and, and then music, and what music might be like in this context. And so we spent a great deal of time and we really wanted to sort of conduct a visual and sensual sort of etymology of the musical sources that John Cale was exploring concurrently with Lou Reed and how they found each other, right? And, um, and, and I, I had watched a screening recently and realized like it takes an hour to yeah. get to a full, to kind of return to a Velvet song with a, from, a, from the album cut 
with a Lou Reed vocal and that the audience might sort of forget what they're watching <laughs> and be in a state of dreaming and kind of rediscover that music sort of from through the back door and unprepared for what they were to hear. And that maybe that is the best way to have that jolt of recognition of what that music was and what was radical about it at the time. I do want to leave some time for audience questions. Um, we are able to take your questions. There, I think there are microphones set up, but I'm just going to ask one more question to um, to you, Todd and Ed. Maybe you can weigh in too. Like, can you speak a little bit about the dedication at the end of the film? Um, Jonas was the very first interview we conducted in 2018. He had turned 96 years old, and we wanted to make sure that we got him on film. And uh, there's outside of the sort of music culture in terms of the film culture, but the film culture was already crossing boundaries and, you know, and so interested in incorporating other, the other arts as he himself so beautifully describes. There was no single figure who was sort of served except for Andy Warhol as a kind of, um, you know, core um, conductor of so much creative activity. And both Andy and Jonas had that sense of inclusion, curiosity, openness, you know, that created platforms and places for people to come and discover work and or create or make work, you know. And so he was he was with us and uh, and he's still with us. And uh, it meant so much to have him be a part of this movie. Ed, you knew Jonas from back yeah, in the day? I, yeah, I think the word he said is inclusion. That, that, that's, he always was open to everyone and brought him in and let them be part of what his scene was. I mean, Andy would say about Jonas that he was the leap, least pop <laughs> the least pop sort of yeah. art yeah. Uh, philosophical figure yeah. in their in their orbit. He was very serious. Yeah. He said even when he laughed, it was <laughs> with seriousness, you know. And yet Andy loved Jonas and they appreciated Jonas and his Eastern European roots and his own way into this world was his own. And they respected him utterly, you know. But Jonas also loved and and appreciated all of these queer you know, artists who were yeah. who were doing something a little outside his own vernacular as an artist. So. <clears throat> okay, I think we can take um, maybe two or three audience questions, and I'm not sure where the microphones are, but oh yeah, I see them. So uh, if you have a question, maybe step up to the microphone, and uh, we can hear you with our headphones. take these off as well? Sure. Hi. Um, this is exciting. Um, I, you have a very long and inspiring history of making, um, thank you, uh, of making fictional music films. Um, and I'm curious what led you to choose nonfiction for this film and then also what you learned differently in the process of making this than you learn from like making the, the fiction interpretations that you've created? Everyone heard the question, obviously. Yeah. Um, thanks for that question. Yeah, you know, it's funny to have these sort of strict categorical divisions between fiction and nonfiction, particularly in the ways that I guess I've approached the fictional telling of stories that we bring a certain measure of expectation of the real story to, that I've sort of frustrated in various ways as a, in conceptual ideas about how to tell the story of Bob Dylan or the, Vel or the glam rock era or whatever it was. And that this film as a nonfiction quote unquote category is basically made up of all of these other films and filmmakers work. 
and music that takes you into other kinds of storytelling and other kinds of ways of pushing boundaries and not projecting any kind of agreed upon objective reality or truth. And of course, every documentary is a subjective process of decision-making, artistic decision-making that is guiding that. So I think it's really about embracing the permeability of all of these categories, you know? And that's part of what's inspiring. And that's what was happening by the artists of this time in the ways that they were challenging what, what rigid categories had always separated themselves from other mediums of art. And they wanted to break it down and they wanted to question what the duration of a film could be and what the relationship of audience to spectacle might be, you know, all of these really interesting and exuberant questioning, this questioning going on is really what we tried to sort of embrace and bring to also what we expect of a documentary. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I just have a quick question for Ed. Um, at the beginning, before the Velvet Underground film started, um, there was a said it was going to show a trailer for the for the Berlin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did it get cut off or? Yeah, yeah. I'd love yeah. to see that. I, Is there I, any way we can I, see it? <laughs> sure. I told him not not to show it, but he didn't know where to cut it. Oh, okay. so after that statement, we'll along be, yeah. in my loft, I found on a reel the Berlin promo video promo mm. that I again I was looking for for years and that that story that went with it was you know Lou came up and kicked the tripod as I grabbed onto the camera and this was 17 years it was in 73 so I was and I, and he went back to the microphone and I set it up and we shot the video so in passing, when we did songs, they said, do you have any remembrance of the time when we shot the Berlin promo? You came up and kicked my tripod. And he goes, I don't remember much from back then and <laughs> smiled and walked away. You know, it's, it's, so the, but yes, I, maybe I'll put that online. OK, that'd be great. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. So no other questions. Maybe I'll just ask. Um, uh, okay, please go ahead. Uh, this is to Todd. My name is Spencer Drade. I'm here with the fabulous Sylvia Reed. And uh, we designed Lou Reed's Magic and Lost New York album and the 93 tour. And I wanted to say, I uh, wanted to bring up a question. The, the quality of film is amazing. Was there a lot of refurbishing done on the film? Um, you know, uh, and by the way, the footage is amazing. In my life, I knew, um, uh, you know, with Sylvia, knew Lou a little bit, but I just want to tell you that, it, that, that the interviews were amazing in my life, not seeing a lot of this footage, not knowing about a lot of this background. And I thought you did a wonderful job on that. But about the film quality, uh, could you tell us about that? Because it's amazing film quality. Thank you so much. I met Sylvia for the first time two nights ago at the premiere. And that was amazing to just have you there and to have you here again tonight. Um, uh, the, the films that we got, you know, are are from archives that exist around the country, a lot of them based in, in New York. And uh, we, we, it was really the arduous work of Wyatt Stone, one of the other archive producers, Carolyn Hepburn at Motto, and the entire team at Motto to doggedly uh, track down the best versions and the best sources. We also started the process by spending time in Pittsburgh at the Warhol Museum and getting close to the folks there, Greg Pierce, the curate, the um, archivist in particular, um, to sort of establish the primary relationship that we would be drawing from. I mean, the film 
we ultimately licensed two and a half hours of film in this film that runs two hours, uh, most of which is avant-garde films from the 1960s. But it's that much extra material because it's there's so many multiple screen um, s- sequences in the movie and probably 45 minutes of it is is Warhol footage alone. But also with with Raj Roy from MoMA and a lot of the people who've been restoring the and preserving the Warhol material, we were lucky enough to benefit from the extraordinary quality of so much material. And I would also like to thank Sylvia because she really supported and implemented you know, when it went from St. Anne's to BAM, me making the uh, film with Channel 4, and she was kind of the liaison of getting it done. So thank you, Sylvia. Maybe I'll just wrap with one question for Todd, then we'll last question. I just wanted to ask you if you're, you know, with Velvet Goldmine and Bowie and, and then I'm Not There and Dylan. Um, I wonder with those two films, what were you working t- through or working towards something in terms of your relationship with those artists? And how does that compare to what you did here with the Velvet Underground? You know, was there like working towards the process of greater understanding or, or, or something? And, and, you know, and also just understanding the position of being being a fan, I think, which is also what those films are about. So. Yeah, I would say particularly Velvet Goldmine is really rooted in fandom and how the whole kind of um, experiment of glam rock, which existed on both sides of the pond and was sort of an infatuation between New York and the Velvets in particular and the Stooges and Bowie and Bolin and Roxy and all those brilliant interpreters. Um, But that it was a way in which it it allowed the fan to enter into the process of reimagining themselves and participating in this um, mutability around self in terms of, in this particular case, in terms around androgyny and even being a mortal human being and all of these things that, that were being employed in the language of glam rock. With Bowie, I mean, with Dylan, sorry, it was more really about that way that this artist, um, by necessity, by design, by a grand scheme, survived the intensity and the challenge of his success in a very concentrated era that we describe in this film by sort of by sort of multiplying himself into different phases and different um, attitudes about his work and in and almost with an aggressive uh, necessity killing off the last Bob Dylan so he had the sort of creative free space to start again and things were moving so rapidly at this time creatively and culturally and he was sucking in and sponging up so many influences but that in those various personas that he represented you see a kind of depiction of american genre uh being played out as well and movements from more sort of truth telling and protest singing to poetic rejections of sort of answers to how this society gets solved um i think this uh, yet again this band this band is 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 unique this moment is unique it serves more as a sort of prequel i would say to the glam rock era but it really was so much about this um non-heteronormative kind of attitude about art and about the kind of statements being put out and a darker, disturbing kind of sound that they used to convey those ideas, you know. But in all the things that were going on in the 1960s, was, which was immense and still st- sort of staggering in its range of output, there wasn't a lot of, there weren't a lot of people talking about 
pain and vulnerability and the fragility of the male, you know, identity, I guess, for lack of a better word, that Lou Reed so, so spoke to. And I think I gave permission to a lot of other genres of music and kinds of content to enter into popular music that was not allowed bef conceivable beforehand. I think that's a, a great place to end. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming and Todd and Ed, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks you guys for having Oh, I should say we're going to, um, we will bell. actually bring Todd and Ed back with um, Amy Taubin yeah. and some other special guests for um, a free talk um, right here tomorrow. So um, please, please come for that as well. Thank you again. Right. Thanks guys. Great.